Cloud is good. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Lisa. We work you awful hard around here, don't we? <laughs> it's all done in love. I know. Let's have a hand for these amazing ministers, Lisa David Marshall. Thank you. <laughs> and the amazing Thomas Ryan. The, <laughs> the quiet presence behind him. The loud minister? The loud minister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exuberant. <laughs> exuberant. We love that about, about you. You're exuberant. Well, what I had to talk about tonight, you know, this is, this is technically the end of the January basic series because uh, there's not much January left. And then Saturday, Sunday, rather, we begin the next series, which is also going to be on basics. So we're going to do basics all year, but with different emphases, and in February the emphasis will be on human relationships, science of mind, metaphysical teachings, and human everyday relationships. And then in March we'll get into career and creativity and work, and a little later in the year we'll do physical and emotional health, and uh, relationships to other spiritual traditions, and I don't know what all is going to come of it. but. For tonight, what I thought we would discuss to kind of wrap up the first wave of this, of basics, and I realize I'm talking to a room full of people tonight who are well acquainted with the basics. There is no one here. You're not. Okay. I, I get the feeling that you are, but then you, then you will be. Uh, but we don't have any newcomers at this service tonight, uh, so they'll, they'll, uh, we'll find another way to get the word to them. But this has to do with how to pray for other people, how to pray for other people from the standpoint of metaphysical teaching. On Sunday, I talked about being an agent of healing, how to be an agent of healing. And I said that we are all already agents of healing. We were born that way. There's, there's a, you were born to have that job, you know, and it's a matter of taking up that mantle, taking up that divine inheritance and getting getting on with it, you know, that, but I said the first, the first thing to do, the first step to take in being an agent of healing is to do no harm, to not be an agent of harming. And then you look at your intention and your intention is kindly and benevolent then you move forward with that. Well, similarly tonight, having to do with how to pray for other people, the first thing not to do is pray at other people. You see, this is not a spiritual teaching that posits a duality. Instead, we posit a unity. Not a dualism, a what they call a monism, a singularity. That there is God, humankind, all creation, and it's all one. Now, it doesn't express the same way at each level of itself. You have a different way of expressing than a cat or a dog or a canary bird has or a rock or a tree or a cloud, but you're made up of the same intelligence expressing at that level of itself that is most appropriate to the moment. How all of this came to be, no one knows, but we know that it is so. We know that we have identity, we have presence, we have agency. We also know that we individually can change our minds. And when we change our minds, the, the outcomes tend to change as well. Forms change around us, expectations change. It's from that place then that we pray. It's from a place of oneness rather than from a place of separation from that oneness. We pray from a fullness rather than from an emptiness. Now this runs counter to the way many of us were taught to pray in early life. Uh, I was taught to pray, like maybe most people in the Christian tradition are, to pray from an emptiness I don't have. I don't have, I'm not this, and I, and I choose to be this, or I choose to get this, receive this somehow in my life. God, would you please come, come into my life and, and bring repair? You know, fix this, do, do something for me here. Or secondarily, would you fix them over here? I was taught to, right? I was taught to say my prayers every night for the people I cared about and, and so on. And it, creeping into that would be that I knew what was best for them 
As a little kid, you, you, don't, you don't feel like you, you should. But the older you get, especially if you're raised in a religious tradition that's initiatory, and they put you through different state, by which I mean like baptism and confirmation, and you get a little deeper into the thing and deeper into the thing, you start feeling like you really have it going on spiritually because you belong. You're in this community. They accept you. They trust you. You maybe have some authority. You have some power. You start thinking you know it's better for other people. And so you start sort of praying at them. And you'll pray at the people around you who are unspiritual, who are even, oh God, atheistic or something like that. The people who are drinking and using drugs or, or the people who are having illicit relationships or the people who are, you know, and you'll start, you, oh God, please. And then it becomes the people who vote differently than you do. <laughs> you see, it ultimately comes down to that. Let them see the error of their ways. Whatever it is you don't like, they become fair targets, fair game for prayer. And we do this justifying it as that we are coming from a high and holy place with this and, and really do have God on our side. But of course, the funny thing is that these other people that we're talking about here, if they were to pray, they'd think they had God on their side. They'd be praying for us to change. Uh, of course, maybe they're not as religious as we are, so they're not officially praying. Unless you consider that every thought is a prayer. And it doesn't matter that you bracket the thing in prayer. This is one of the things to really understand about judgment, condemnation, and whatnot, is that when you say to the universe, now I don't mean to judge. It's not taking a time out from receiving that. It doesn't go on pause. It doesn't shut itself off like the recording gizmo, you know? When you say, I don't mean to judge, it means nothing to the infinite. It's the feeling, the intensity of emotion that's wrapped around the idea that causes it to, to receive it, causes it to receive that thing as a prayer. The intensity of feeling and the clarity of direction, it will receive that as a prayer. Whether you mean for it to be that or not, it will receive that as a prayer. And so when you look at your life and you, and you condemn it, you damn it, you with vitriol, you know, especially if you do this repeatedly, not just one time, it's not like life is gonna hit you, but if you're forever condemning and complaining about things, expecting that they're going to get better, they won't. And the reason they won't is because you're using a spiritual law that takes you with your word. It doesn't know to deflect, it doesn't know nuances, it doesn't understand about complicated psychology. All it knows is the intensity of feeling, and it takes it and runs with it. So in prayer, our every thought is potentially a prayer, especially if wrapped with feeling. This is why you want to be careful, not paranoid, but careful about what you say, what you declare in your own mind as well as out loud. A sense of humor is a wonderful thing, but as I mentioned Sunday, if the sense of humor runs towards snarkiness and constant, do you ever know anybody like that? Maybe you have somebody in your life like that right now, or maybe you feel like you are somebody <laughs> like this in your life right now, who tends to be the one who finds something wrong with stuff in kind of a funny, clever way, you know? Like, I don't know, you walk in a room and people are watching TV, and you make some kind of snarky comment about what the character's wearing or how they're speaking or what they're selling and you find yourself doing this over and over again and everything is kind of said with such, sort of a snort, you know, sort of a derisive kind of snort about, yeah, you know, and then at the end of the day you're exhausted and a little bit sick, okay? Many of us were taught obliquely, not on a whiteboard, you know, or chalkboard, but it was kind of gotten across to us that in order to be clever and mature in this society, you had to be the one who kind of had it figured out that most of it was BS, you know, that most of what's going on here, this is really kind of a racket, and I see it, and, and so we, we go along with that. And we wonder why we're sick and tired so much of the time. We're weighed down by these, by these judgments. 
and the people who are kind of the goody two shoes type, which is everything is wonderful, and it's coming up, and they're just kind of all Pollyanna about it, you know? God, they're healthy, and they live for a zillion years, you know? Why? Because in that respect, the subconscious mind really can't take a joke. It really only knows the intensity of feeling around packaging the thought. And if the feeling is light and joyful, it tends to respond with lighter and more joyful experiences. And if the feeling is heavy and dense, it tends to respond with those kinds of experiences. Again, not as punishment and not as reward, but as information. I mentioned information on Sunday and one of our practitioners who was at the 9.30 came up afterward and asked me if I read a certain article which I hadn't, so he sent it to me. <clears throat> and I still haven't read it because it's a long, complex science article that I want to devote some real time to. But the gist of the thing, just skimming it, have you heard of dark matter? Dark matter? There's this school of thought now that says that dark matter is random bits of information. Just like DNA is information. It's random bits of information floating out there. It's data. Data. Not just undifferentiated energy, but intelligent, purposeful energy. Information is what we get back. It's what we send out. We are basically information reception, management, retrieval, and distribution systems, if you want to get right down to the clinical side of it. This is what we, this is what we do. Prayer is information. Where does it go? Does it go to God? Yeah, but God, as we understand, God is not sitting on a throne out by Alpha Centauri. God is the essence of life right present where we are fully present at every point within itself, one of those points being right here. So yeah, it goes into that. And what does it do? Creates a wave of information that then causes physical form, talking atomic structures and stuff, to conform to it, to respond to it in a certain way. When I pray for you, so we're talking about praying for other people, I am having a knowing. We laughed about this in class today. It's a cute expression, isn't it? I'm having a knowing. Did somebody else come back with, well, I'm knowing a having. Well, I'm doing, a, well, anyway. I'm, we have a knowing. I'm having a knowing about you. What am I knowing about you? What should I know about you? What you've asked me to know, and not much more. Because you are supreme in your own experience. You create your own reality. You don't need somebody else to do it. You don't need a minister, a practitioner, a guru, or somebody to do it for you. We do this for one another out of love, out of kindness. And it has nothing to do with credentials. There have been plenty of times. I mean, I've been studying, I've been practicing spiritual mind treatment 44 years. I looked it up. 44 years, man. That's a long time. That's basically my entire adult life. And, then some. Uh, and in that 44 years, there have been countless times when I've gone to somebody else and said, no, this for me. Because I can't see the forest through the trees. Because here's reality right up here. Because this is my life right up here in my face. And you don't have my life in your face. You might have your life in your face, but you don't have my life in your face. And so would you know something for me? And I go to the people that I know, know how to do that. Most, but not all of whom, are affiliated with the religious science teaching. I also know some people who are not affiliated with the religious science teaching who pick up the same idea other places. And they're people that I would go to with this. So what they're not going to do is they're not going to decide how my life ought to work out and whip one up for me. They're going to take what I give them, and again, not much else, maybe just kind of a generic blessing around that, and they're going to treat about or pray about what I've asked them to pray about. Now there's an exception to this. And the exception is 
the prayer of general well-being that we can do for people about whom we know nothing. If you ask me to pray for you, I'll, I'll give you a little interview. I'll ask you, what do you want? I'll ask you to tell me enough about it to where I can picture it and feel it. I'll have no judgment about it. I won't say, well, I don't know. I've never seen you be that happy before. I'm not sure you, you can stand it. I'm not going to say, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a tall order. Really? You sure? Don't you want to scale that back a little bit? You know, but I'm going to interview you just to get a clear idea. But what if I can't interview you? What if you're in a coma? What if you're on the other side of the world and out of touch? I can't reach you. What if I don't know exactly who you are? You're a friend of a friend of a relative of a friend and I have no permission to contact you. And we get prayer requests like this all the time in this center. You've heard them on Wednesday nights. You've heard people get up and say, I have a cousin of a nephew of somebody somewhere who is having surgery next Thursday, would you, would you treat? We don't get on the phone with that person. We don't try to track down that person and ask them what they want. So what do we do? Well, if you're the one who's asking for prayer, we treat about your peace, first of all. We treat to know that you have peace and you have clarity about your family member, okay? You always want to do that. Like you brought up Bill, you know, Marty too. I mean, there's, you know, when there's one sick, there's one, there's one worried. And sometimes, well, often they say, depending on the severity of the illness, they say the person who's the well caretaker is more in need of prayer right in that moment often than the person who's the ill patient. Well, We've done second and third and fourth hand treatments for people here on Wednesday nights, as we do through our website and through all of us get contacted by people basically globally, you know, from time to time. So how do we, how do we treat for the person that we don't know what they want? We treat to know that there is something that does know what they want. We treat to know that the one life that they're in is right where they are and it's sourcing them with absolutely everything and we treat about that with the same degree of conviction and intensity of feeling as we would if we were picking out for them a million dollar outcome, okay? The same, it's not a, it's not a generic toss off kind of a secondhand scaled down bogus treatment to say, I'm treating for perfect right order for you. If you have a real clear idea, the perfect right order is what it says it is. It's perfect and it's right and it's orderly, you know? Then you just, you just do this thing and maybe they get well in the conventional sense, maybe they go on, maybe they prosper, maybe they go through some struggles, but whatever they go through is somehow better than it would have been if you hadn't done this. I'll tell you a story I haven't told in a while, some of you may have heard it, but when I was becoming a minister, I had to go to Los Angeles for the last round of testing I, there was a long written exam, two day written exam you had to take. And then I had to go out there for the oral panels. And you guys have been through this, so you know what they're like. <clears throat> and there were three, only back in those days, they didn't even make any pretense about having it be kind of warm or user friendly or whatever. It was like, you know, ushered into this room and there sit three figures. They, if they'd been in cowls, it would have been, you know, with candles, it would have been perfect. <laughs> sitting there and they, and they summon you forward, you know, in this. And so you have to stand, you have to give a sermon from memory and you have to answer a bunch of questions and stuff and then they dismiss you and they let you know if you passed and, and uh, I did. And so then I was coming home. So I used to commute out there on Muse Air, if any of you remember Muse Air, they used to fly out a hobby. They were a nice airline. Well. They had a car service. I, I booked a car service that had picked me up at LAX and brought me to our headquarters and then it was to take me back. And so the, the car comes and so I'm in the back of this, this car and 
we're driving through town and LA traffic is awful always at all all hours of day and night. And we're heading down La Cienega toward the airport and the, and traffic stops and something has just happened. Something right where we are has just happened and, and there's you can feel the energy, you know. And so I roll down the window and right there I'm like in the back seat of the car and maybe even as far away as like where Georgie's foot is, there's a motorcycle on its side. Guy had dropped his, his motorcycle and he's lying there, the the rider. Uh, face down, prone on the ground in an all black jacket, black gloves, helmet, dark visor. You know, he was a, he knew what he was doing motorcycle wise. He had just hit something that had just apparently gone through the intersection in front of the car and all of this. Then we hear sirens and, <clears throat> and people are starting to come. Well, I look at this guy. And the first thought, I mean, it's maybe a terrible first, like incredibly self-absorbed thought to have, but the first thought I have is this is the last part of my ministerial exam. <laughs> okay, this, what do you do? I don't know if he's dead. I don't know if it's a man or a woman in this. I don't know if this person's dead. I don't know what their life is, what their wishes are. Should I treat for him to bound up and be well and get on his bike and roar off and I can't interfere in that way. I cannot interfere in that way. I don't know what he wants, but there is something that does know. He knows or she knows or whoever this person is. In the depth of their soul, they know what, what they really, really long to create in their life and there's a power that has never been so much as you couldn't get a sheet of paper between him and that power, you know, that has known that knows now what he wants. And so what I'm gonna do is simply affirm the presence of that power right here in this situation, in this godling, and let it go at that. And as I did that, there was more activity, sirens came, something happened, we got waved off someplace, and, and off we went on the rest of our trip, and of course I never knew the outcome of this. It, would, it wasn't even something that would have made the news locally probably because accidents happen so to know what became of that person and no idea except i do in here and somehow they were better and stronger and more hopeful than they would have been before and maybe they died on the spot maybe they bled out right there on that spot and went on into the next expression and if they did then that's perfect too then they had finished whatever it was they came to this earth to do at this time and they had gone on what I did, what I tried to do, and what I encourage everybody to try to do is affirm the presence of a benevolent and all-powerful creator, fully present at every point within itself that knows what we want and how we want it. And when you do this, it's amazing. Here's the thing, <clears throat> last thing, I think. I'm running out of voice, sorry. Uh, you, know how, you know how sometimes you're in traffic and some maniac comes through and then you see him in your rear view mirror and they come 90 to nothing, you know, and they they shoot past you and you think, let there be a cop over the next hill, right? <laughs> and there almost never is. And you see them now, they're just taillights, <laughs> way yonder, you know, doing the, and they and they seem to, and it's like, well, God, then I could have gotten away with that. You know, I'd like to get to where I'm going just as bad as they'd like to get to where I'm going. Why aren't I driving 100 miles an hour? Am I chicken? You know, am I, am I just a weenie of a person that I'm not willing to take the same kind of risk that this person? You know, and you put yourself through all these changes, right? But you know how every once in a while some maniac goes past you in traffic and they go over the next hill and they do get a ticket? And you roll by and you look and you there, but for the grace of God, go on. And with this sense of smug superiority of being a fine, upstanding citizen that you are, you drive, you sensible, rape to your next your next destination, you know. So I bring this up because that's silly, but what happens in, in real life too in terms of prayer is sometimes the situation that you pray about, treat about, even the people that you treat about, uh, there doesn't seem to be any real change, any real improvement right there in the moment. But these people over here in this situation, 
that was not on your mind when you treated suddenly blossoms. How did that happen? Maybe because you let go of the energy you had holding these people down because the last step of prayer is release, you know? And we were worried and worried and worried and now you bring me this and I treat about this and I, I release my worry. I'd already spoken my word over here, but I release my worry and so now this is free to thrive. Or sometimes it hits in odd numbers and it's the first, third, fifth, seventh people along the lines that really benefit or it's somebody you've never known or you treat to heal a situation with a friend and it doesn't really seem to go anywhere and you make three new friends that night. You just don't know how it's going to get better. But I'll tell you what, it gets better. It gets better. Your life gets better when you pray. Your life gets better immeasurably when you pray affirmatively in faith believing, not to a distant judging God who's going to mull over your request. Well, I don't know, do you serve it? Look at you with beady little eyes, you know. You've been here before <laughs> wanting stuff from me. I don't know. You know, if instead you treat from a place of there's just one life and it is exuberantly, positively, beautifully all at the ready to deliver the goods to come across, if you believe that, then somehow, in some way, before the clock strikes 12, <laughs> you're going to have an experience of confirmation of that. Confirmation of that. People will make uh, a beeline to you. They'll want to stand in your light. They'll want to know how you know this stuff. People will sit here, they go to work, and they go to the water cooler, the proverbial water cooler that you stand around and complain about the job and the boss and all of this. And they suddenly people are looking at him and saying, you're different, you've changed. You're, you're, not, you're not this big ball of complaint that you used to be. What is it you know that I don't? And what you've acquainted yourself with is this singularity, this monism in which you live. So those are some thoughts on how to pray for other people. Um, how you pray is your business, not mine, not the business of the house here. We don't monitor prayers and stuff. These are just suggestions to build into your prayer life, to assume that at the fundamental level, the most basic possible level, nothing is wrong and nothing ever has been on any, on any level with anyone, okay? So let's know together now, we're gonna have a knowing. We're gonna have a knowing as I speak this word in faith believing that there is one life, that life is God, that life is all the life there is, and that life is my life right now it's the life of all who hear this word. That life is everywhere. It is at all time. It has always been. It shall always be. And it is at heart perfection. It contains everything within it. And some of what it contains within it might look a little random, a little messy but it still fits just like some art some music some writing is done without punctuation with a smear of color with a cacophony of notes to make a point to create a feeling an environment well, you and I live in physical bodies. They seem to have certain laws and rules associated with them, and we observe these, while at the same time aware that there's an overarching law that says simply, you are my beloved, in which nothing has been wrong, or ever could be. It does not know aging or death. There is an ethical law that does not know sin or shame or humiliation. There is a law of human relationships that does not know estrangement or fear or suspicion. It's beyond all that. It simply shines in the light and it's this whole and perfect one. And from that I speak this word about every person here and every person that we touch, we who are here, 
and whom they touch and whom they touch and on out as the numbers geometrically expand out into life. That the recognition of this oneness is supreme now. That everyone feels at home in the heart of the universe, makes their choices from that place. For this knowing, the way that it rolls out in form, I am so deeply grateful. I release this word now into the infinite, calling it done, and so it is. So it is. Thank you. Once